Brilliant. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, we started um, the Aberton Native Bee Project in uh, 2016. Um, it took a, took a while to get going, but it all started because of a, a chance meeting between the chief exec of Essex and Suffolk Water and the Bibber chair at the time, Nick Bentham Green. And Essex and Suffolk Water were raising the level of the um, reservoir by about five metres, and that was going to inundate the local, uh, some of the local um, land, and they wanted to offset the environmental impact. So reintroducing a, a native uh, species into the area ticked a lot of boxes for them. Um, the Some of our bees are on Essex Wildlife Trust land, um, who are also enthusiastic about the project. Not all wildlife trusts are. Um, and it's also relatively remote. Um, and that's a rough idea. At the top of the screen there, you've got Colchester. Um, but the area around here is um, uh, relatively unpopulated by people or bees. And most of the people in who keep bees locally are involved in the project. So uh, the benefits of groups means that you've, you've got more people, more bees to work with. Um, so you know, you've got more choice of which bees you might want to improve. It's more enjoyable to work with others. Um, beekeeping um, is a bit of a solitary affair most of the time, but it's good to get involved with your local association or group of beekeepers to work with them. Um, it's an opportunity to learn from others. And, and while some people have got more knowledge than others, it's it, some of the questions that beginner beekeepers ask um, make you think about your own beekeeping and sometimes are quite insightful. And uh, I've not been to many beekeeping events without cakes, and I'm sure that in the last 12 months, most beekeepers have lost weight due to the uh, lack of ability to eat cakes uh, at beekeeping meetings. So when you're starting a group, you've got some key decisions to make and it, it's I, helpful if you make them at the start um, and, and think about what the aims of the group. And there's lots and lots of choices that can be made and I'm hoping to make some of those uh, clear and uh, simple this evening. First of all, you need to think about what type of bee you're looking to uh, work with and we'll talk in some detail about that what characteristics do you want in your bees who should be involved um, are you going to have a formal or an informal organization my preference is informal because i like to spend time with bees rather than admin but you know there are advantages in having a your own bank account and such like um, then you've got to decide what methods you're going to use and there are myriad uh, methods that can be used. Um, so when you're looking at the choice of what type of bees, uh, there are a few choices. Um, in my own operation, I work with locally adapted bees, um, bees that are adapted to the local environment. And it, the, the diseases is important. There's work that's been done by the National Bee Unit um, and the, there's some excellent videos on the National Honey Show uh, YouTube channel, uh, which were also organised by Roger. Um, and there's a lady on there who's one of the top bee scientists, Kirsty Stainton, and she talks about the different strains of AFB and EFB that are circulating around the country. And we are importing new strains of EFB and AFB. Um, and your, your bees may be um, adapted to local strains of viruses and bacteria, pests and pathogens, but um, bring new pests and pathogens into the area or bring new bees into the area and they might not be as well adapted. <clears throat> um, some good news is that temper and hygienic behaviour are highly heritable. Work that's been done in Switzerland by the native um, the uh, honeybee group there, which is government sponsored and funded, um, they use um, bookfast methods to breed native AMM honeybees. Um, and they've, they've found that temper goes from gener 
generation to generation. But um, interestingly, from a bee farmer's point of view, productivity is the least heritable trait in honeybees. And there are things that you can use as a proxy for productivity, but productivity in itself doesn't translate to the next generation. Um, improving the bees with the traits that you want can be achieved quickly within a few generations um, using selection, both natural and beekeeper. And while it's very hard to lose bees over winter, winter is actually our friend and actually the bees that survive the winter um, have done so for a reason. And the challenge is because bees are very um, genetically um, flexible, they, the challenge is keeping to the standards. So you can get the bees to be calm easily, um, but you've got to be constantly on your toes working at the, the selection criteria you've decided upon so that you can keep them to that standard. Um, as well as locally adapted bees, that's kind of like a halfway house, which is near native, which are bees that have got the traits of native bees in their behavior and may or may not have native appearance. <clears throat> and then you've got the native bee. Um, and as I said, I've got a foot in both camps. Um, and at Abberton, we're focused on reintroducing the native bee. Um, as you probably know, it's been in Britain since the last ice age. It's adapted to our climate, forages at lower temperature and poor weather. You know, the books often suggest that bees will fly at 12 degrees centigrade. Um, uh, but I, I have bees that will fly at four degrees and bring in pollen. Um, they mate at lower temperature, which can be important in the British weather. Um, they're frugal, they need less forage and will fly when... I mean, Italian bees are perfectly good bees, but they're adapted for a 10-month summer. Um, and, you know, we're lucky if we see a few weeks. Um, and then the, the, the native bees need less feeding in summer and winter. That then means that they're low maintenance. And um, one of the important things about working with a pure subspecies is that um, you get less genetic variation from generation to generation, so you can get more consistent results. So the next thing that you need to decide upon is what methods of queen rearing are you going to use? The One of the things that uh, I've realized over the years is that queen rearing looks really, really complicated, um, but the reason it's complicated is that there are a lot of different ways you can do the same thing. So there are actually just five things you need to do and just pick a method of doing it. So the first thing is select the queens that you want to propagate from according to your criteria. So you decide on your criteria and there are dozens of different criteria. And my advice is keep it really, really simple. Just you know, start with one and, and build out from there. You need a method of transferring larvae. Um, so, you know, there are things like um, cell punches, grafting, uh, cup kits. But pick one. Um, you want a method of starting feeding and incubating your uh, cells that you've transferred the larvae uh, into. Excuse me. So there are lots of different ways of starting colonies. Uh, sorry, starting queen cells. Um, you've, you've, as you'll know, you've just got to get the colonies into a state where they want to make queens. Um, and you're doing this artificially. Um, and you've got obviously queenless starters, colonies that start off as queenless and then um, are uh, made queen right, like the cloak method. Um, and also you can use queen right systems all the way through. The best method I found, um, you can see demonstrated really well on YouTube by Richard Noel, um, a method he picked up from Mike Palmer. Um, in, in, so if you look at him setting up a starter colony, um, he starts off with a colony with a queen in, takes the queen away, um, 
adds more bees and, and really gets a colony absolutely um, stuffed with young bees. You need a method of mating queens. Um, you've got different types of nooks, queen castles, mini nooks. Um, personally, I found using queen castles a bit of a faff. Um, you're far better off using um, a six frame nook and using it as, as three frames if you need and dummy down. Um, or, or mini nooks. And the advantages of nooks versus mini nooks is really down to resources. Nooks usually are more successful but need a lot more resources. Mini nooks um, are a lot, slightly lower success rate, um, but um, you, don't, you only need a couple of bees to get them going. And then finally, you need to have a method of introducing either your ripe cells or virgin queens into your nook and mini nook. So you just, just pick one of those to start with. And each year to, to make more interest for the group, you can vary these, but start with one, one of these um, items each and perfect it and then move on to more advanced methods. So the traits that um, we are looking for are simply that the bees are calm and the bees in this picture um, are from a calm colony um, from my own bees um, and the bees just sit on the comb, they ignore me, there's no bees in the air um, and the queen continues to lay um, and, and that's exactly what I'm looking for. Um, strong spring, spring buildup. There's a bit. There's a big difference between bees being frugal and being sick. So bees that don't build up in the spring, there's usually a problem. Um, so um, strong spring buildup is a colliery for health, um, and um, strong spring buildup in my part of the world in Suffolk also means um, honey production. So you can't select directly for production but you can select for health and buildup. Um, I also want uh, a low swarming tendency. Um, so selection methods, you need to decide on um, your selection according to the criteria that you've uh, chosen. So as I've mentioned before, winter natural selection is important. Uh, and our friend. Um, the next one is queen culling. The, the more brutal you're prepared to be in your selection, the faster you will make progress. Um, so it, it's taking out of the, the gene pool, the queens that um, do not meet your criteria. Um, and then the, the next area is propagating from the best. So again, in my own operation, I would select from the best three colonies out of the 100 I have and, and make lots of queens from just those three. And then the next bit, which is the difficult bit and what we're looking at at Aberton is drone mothers. The importance of drone mothers is these, these in, the, in the picture, you can see two of our native daughter queens and you'll notice that while you've got the nice dark daughter queen because her mother and her father were native she's mated with tom dick and harry essex bees and um, there there are some bees here that have got more italian coloring and then you've got some that have got more native coloring as well but the fact that these that uh, daughters are um, mixed subspecies doesn't really matter because when she lays drones they come from unfertilized eggs so her sons will be pure native um, so what we want to do at Abiton is flood our area with um, these drone mothers in hives in in the local vicinity and then we'll get our area flooded with native drones um, but you know that sort of thing requires scale and isn't the sort of thing that an individual beekeeper can do so when you're looking to form a group um, you need to think about recruiting members um, we started with the local 
Beekeepers Association. We work very closely with Barbara Sharp, who's chair of Colchester Beekeepers. Um, and, and if you can get the local beekeepers on board, it really, really helps because you've got an established network um, and, and they can put you in contact with people that would be interested. Um, so when I started, I went and did a talk for Colchester Beekeepers. Um, I then got Roger to come down and do a bee improvement for all day. Um, and then he, Roger did a practical queen rearing uh, two day course. Um, there are lots of Facebook and internet forums where you can um, gain interest. And about half of the Abbotton group when we started were beginners. And actually this was really good because beginners come without any pre-conceived -con ideas um, and, and are very willing to learn. So we had a few experienced beekeepers, um, a few knowledgeable beekeepers and a lot of beginners. And one of the things that we learned through this was that we had beekeepers who were able to graft successfully before they even had their own bees. So that was one of the key learnings was anyone can graft as long as you can have good corrected vision um, and uh, a steady hand. We need to decide whose equipment are you going to use. So when we started, it takes a little bit of time to raise money. <coughs> and um, at, at first we used Bill, who's a local beekeeper. He lent us three highs for the first colonies. Um, I lent a little bit of equipment um, and that, but within a short period of time, we acquired our own and I'll talk about fundraising. Partnerships are important. Um, our landlord is Essex and Suffolk Water and um, they, have a, they have a scheme um, for grants. Um, and so working with other people can bring other benefits, uh, storage and, and things like that. Then you've got to decide who's going to get what, who's who's going to have access to what uh, surplus honey. You know, we don't try to make honey, but um, we have a lot of borage around us, so we we get honey whether we like it or not. Um, but that honey actually goes to um, we sell it in bulk, and um, the the funds from that keep us uh, going. Um, so yeah, so working together. With all of the uh, things there, agree a clear purpose from all that, your, your methodology. Communication is, is key and, you know, we all think we're pretty good at it, but we all could probably be better uh, keeping the group up to date with what's, what's going on. Um, I do this in two ways. I, I've got like an email group um, and we've also got a Facebook group. Um, so I... I not everybody's on Facebook, but Facebook's a really good tool. Um, and, and for those not on Facebook, we use uh, the email group. You need to remember that we're working with volunteers. And in my background, I uh, worked in uh, a commercial bank. And um, working in a, in, a, in a business is very different to working with volunteers. Um, you know, volunteers turn up because they want to. Um, employees turn up because they need to um, and, and it's really good to be cognizant of that and if you can understand what the volunteers want out of the project um, and what they're prepared to do then you you get a lot more out of the group so in our group we've had you know people that have made equipment um, kept the the grass cut um, built stands um, all these sort of things and it's amazing how much people are prepared to do um, it helps to agree who, who is going to do what, um, you know, including things like site maintenance. You'll see some pictures of our early days uh, where our grass was a bit um, too long, which, you know, you've got, you've got to think about health and safety um, and, you know, raising finance. Raising finance is relatively easy for um, bee-related projects. Lots of people want to give us money. Um, you know, most of the BKAs I know have got surplus money and uh, struggling for things to spend their money on. So it's, it is relatively easy to get money, um, but it does take time initially. So you might need to start with some borrowed equipment to start with. 
And another thing that we learned is if you're going to operate a group um, as well as rearing queens, which is your primary purpose, you need to do everything that you would do in a normal apiary. You know, if you if you spot signs of disease, you need to deal with it. Um, you know, we've done shuck swarms, we've done barely comb changes, everything that you would do in the general husbandry examinations, um, you, you will do. Um, so it's a really good learning experience for everybody involved because you get to cover everything. So the legal stuff, um, uh, GDPR, um, I can't even remember what the initials stand for, but um, the, I think the DP is data protection. Um, I, I looked into this um, quite deeply at the time, and um, there's there are two kind of like requirements. There's two, if you operate a formal group, and a formal group is defined by having a constitution, written agreement, bank account, or a membership, then you are a formal group. An informal group is just a group of friends that get together, and and that um, for an email group um, formulates that. So we have no constitution, no um, written agreement, um, no bank account, and we don't have a formal membership. So we are an informal email group, and that means that we operate uh, very simply. Um, one thing that you do need to think about is insurance, um, which um, is something that we were covered under my my bee farmers uh, insurance as the apiary is registered in my name um, and through bee base. So raising finance. So decide how much you need. And, um, you know, there are some really good deals through, uh, if, you, if you time the purchase of your equipment to the beekeeping sales, then um, you're going to get money for about, you know, a third of the price that it might cost if you were to get first quality ready-made equipment. Um, all the supermarkets run schemes whereby, you know, since they've been, you've been paying money for carrier bags, all that money goes into a fund and people can bid for that money. When we started, uh, Tesco's was the most generous um, and you could get one, two or four thousand pounds um, from the, the, from bidding for the money and but that's become less generous as people have used fewer, uh, have bought fewer carry bags, but the money's still there. In our case, we were able to approach our landowner and that can be the case in, in, in other groups. Uh, corporates are often looking for things to do uh, which help their uh, consciences and um, wildlife trusts, some are, um, receptive and others uh, consider bees to be a, a, a threat to other bees. So in our area, Norfolk are receptive, Essex are receptive, Suffolk are less receptive. So it's going to depend on where, where you are. Another interesting one is every county has a landfill trust. And, and this is a levy that's put on uh, landfill sites a tax if you would and uh, that money then gets distributed for environmental projects which we would qualify for and if you want to find those and some of the other fundraising available funds available there's a website uh, called entrust.org.uk which lists a lot of those and then you've got to think about working with the bees, have a plan, get everybody involved. You know, when we started, it was, it was a lot of me demonstrating because a lot of people were beginners. Now I stand back and everybody else uh, does the general um, husbandry. Um, split people into working groups. As we got more hives, we found that we needed to get around them quicker or spend all day doing it. Um, Another important consideration is the balance success with learning. It's really important to have little successes to keep the group interested and energised. 
but also you want people to learn. So one of the things that we did was when we did a graft, I would do uh, the top bar and the two of the group would do five cells each. And then on an odd occasion, their graphs would be accepted and mine wouldn't, which obviously makes for some good humour. Um, but it's good to get uh, the balance right. So how much equipment you need depends on your goals. Um, and again, another thing we learned, we started off with three nukes and um, three native queens. And that wasn't enough to get going. So we, um, we got bees donated by our group members, swarms collected. And um, we, we got a, a, a base of bees. So our first year was all about getting enough bees. So all the querying rearing we did, queen rearing we did, was all about making bees. Um, another thing that's worthwhile mention is that a lot, all of our, all of our equipment, we've got enough second brood boxes to be able to double brood all our hives because we're not about making honey, we're about making bees to make queens. Now, if let's say you wanted to produce 10 queens every two weeks and, you know, over a, a season starting on the 1st of May, you might get 12 weeks um, worth of queen rearing. So that's six uh, batches. Um, you'll need about six support colonies and these need to be good, healthy colonies that are producing lots of bees, not sick colonies. Um, a couple of colonies for your breeder queens and a starter. Um, and then you'll need about 24 mini nukes or nukes for this setup. You don't have to set up um, in this way. Um, you can set up a lot smaller and just do an odd batch. But if you wanted to, and this, this sort of thing, when you got this right, would produce maybe about 60 queens over a season if you're lucky and if you get it right and uh, this was our apri in the early days and we didn't really in our budgeting consider proper stands and we started off on pallets um, but you know there's lots of things you need but you know having good stands and not having to bend over double to look at the bees is a, is a big help so our method um, this is another key thing is that all beekeeping methods talk about doing things on day one, day three, day this. Um, but this, this, we found a way of raising queens by just touching the bees once every seven days. And this is a good method to use if you uh, are working and can only touch your bees at the weekend. So week one, uh, we would set up uh, a starter colony in the way that I mentioned earlier. Week two, uh, we knock down the queen cells, the queens have built, graft. Week three, the, we protect the cells. Now, we're, we are working at double the scale I've just mentioned. So we're taking the uh, cells one after a week, they're sealed, and we put them into, a, into a, one of the support colonies, basically, as a finisher. So basically a, a finisher is a normal colony with a queen in, with a queen excluded between two brood boxes and your uh, protected cells with the hair roller cages that you saw on an earlier slide. Um, just move into, into that for another week. And then when you go back the fourth week, your queens will have emerged and they will, have, we meet every Saturday, our queens will emerge on the, Thursday um, but the Virgin Queens are waiting for us when we get there the following Saturday and then we're ready to set up the the mating nukes and then um, it takes a while for the Queens to uh, develop but week seven week eight your Queens are ready to to pick every week you want to add sealed brood into your starter to keep it going and full of fresh bees and one thing that is key with queen rearing is you just need to constantly be checking for queen cells every time you touch your bees 
one emerged queen cell um you know that you've, you've just turned your uh, starter colony into a mating nuke um and you need to start again um and another thing to watch out for is when you are pulling out the uh frame of grafts make sure that you move the frames that are next to it well to one side because we've had a situation where we've just pulled out the um the frame the protection cages come off and you've got virgin queens running around everywhere and uh, and carnage uh, and set you back so when you're good uh, and you and you've you, and this doesn't happen every time but you get more and more uh, success as you go on uh, but when you're good this is what you're looking for so 20 graphs um, mean you're likely to get 14 accepted if you set up your start well um, the bees may knock one or two down so you bank on 12 emerging and of that you might get nine mated I tend tend to find that the queen's mated in May I get about 80% uh june about um 70 and and, and really a, a, a de decreasing return as time goes on and then we we broke down our activities into um phases and our first phase which we've completed um excuse me the, the first phase that we've completed is to build up a sustainable population of bees. Um, so we have, um, we've actually got 17 colonies at the moment um, because the kind of support colonies and the finishing colonies are one and the same. Um, so that was the main thing was just build up the number of bees that you need to, to really get going. And that involves initial queen rearing then the next stage which we're currently in is building up a sustainable drone supply all our queens are all our hives are now headed by native daughters so we're producing our own drones and interestingly i, I picked up i've been looking at research papers over the winter and i found one that showed that um in the experiment they had 20 19 percent of the matings had happened in the same apiary that the queen had flown from um, and up and, and then another 36% had mated within two kilometers um, so um, that kind of like shows you what you can achieve in your local area um, so we are now distributing daughter queens to our members so that they can have these in their hives and uh, start to push out uh, native drones. One of the things that we want to do is establish our own drone producing colonies, but we don't want to spend any more time than we are at the moment. So the, the idea that we're floating is to find sites, provide bees and hives, and then have beekeepers just look after them, after these colonies for us. So we, there's no capital outlay for them and they get to keep the honey. Um, our daughter queens are up and mated and hybridized, but the sons are native. And we're looking to saturate the area with native drones. Um, once we have our daughter queens widely distributed, we can start to um, expect our queens to come back with um, having mated with native drones uh, we can select the queens for native characteristics and appearance which uh, has worked for uh, a number of people who have worked before we had genetic testing uh, people like joe widdicombe would select for color and although the scientists would say this wouldn't work when the bees were tested um, they actually had predominantly native 95 plus percent native dna then we would like to make our queens available for group members and the wider beekeeping community. There are quite a lot of groups in our local area who would like to do something similar. 
And then finally, once we've proven this, because I think we were the first BIBA group to um, actually try lots of people work in areas where native group, native bees are already there in some numbers. And we were the first to try to re we are the first to try to reintroduce um, the subspecies where in an area where it's become highly hybridized. Um, we'd like the group to be operating independently. And the keys to success um, are working in partnership with other organizations. So, you know, with us, it's Essex Wildlife Trust, Colchester Beekeepers, Bibba, um, Tesco's, um, Essex and Suffolk Water. Uh, recruiting members to the group, experiences and necessary good communication is key. You need lots of bees. And once you have lots of bees, you can make lots of bees. After the, you know, the first year, we moved lots of bees in, but I viewed that kind of like as an isolation apiary, if you like. But after you start up, don't move bees back into your um, apiaries. Um, we had a visit from the seasonal bee inspector. We've got American fowl brood in our area. Um, and, you know, Essex is an area that has... Um, some efb and it, it does seem to be getting more prevalent we were we were clear and we've had no signs of any issues um but we're now in a position where we're self-sufficient in bees we're happy to move bees out when we've got surplus but we we're not going to move any in so you want to keep the flow of bees out of your project um raising funding isn't hard for bee related projects and I think one of the key, key things is, you know, I think you might gather from what I've said that everything's easy, but you get a lot of setbacks. You get batches where things just go right. You don't get any, any uh, you, know, you get a week where you go and you pull your batches out and there are no queen cells. Um, and, then, and then you also get weeks where you've got so many virgin queens, you've got no, not enough room for them. So... Um, you've really, really got to look at setbacks as an opportunity to learn, um, be ready for them. And you know, one of my key expressions is you, you cannot fail until you, you give up. So some uh, next steps, if you want to look at these sort of things further, you've, people are very welcome to visit Aberton. I'm very much hoping we've obviously been uh, not meeting in, in 20, 20, um, but I'm hoping to restart in the middle of May, which is the current time scale for the government restrictions lifting. Uh, we have an Essex 4Bs Facebook group um, where we post um, in there. Um, you've got the option of Biver membership for only £20 a year. Um, a, a projects that I've, uh, I'm starting this year is um, inspired by a talk that Mike Palmer did to Cambridge Beekeepers, where he runs a sustainable apiary. And again, he's got a video available on the National Honey Show. So please, uh, on the National Honey Show YouTube channel, so please look him up. Um, but he's got a large scale sustainable apiary. He's got 1500 colonies, 300 nukes, but he overwinters 300 nukes through six foot of snow so, you know, what a lot of beekeepers say, you can't overwinter nukes in the UK. You can. Um, but what, I, what occurred to me was there were 300 people on the, um, on the, on the Zoom and most were um, beekeepers with fewer than six colonies. So it kind of got me thinking, what could a beekeeper starting with one colony do to raise queens really, really simply and sustainably and produce bees to replace losses before they happen. The hardest thing in the world to do is to keep one colony of bees up, uh, alive. So hats off to everybody who does that. Um, and, um, and what I'm looking to do is, is just within the bees in my apiary, I've moved all the bees away apart from the one hive that I'm going to work with. And I'm going to video all the operations that we do, all the uh, weekly inspections, and, um, and, and that will be available through 
the West Suffolk Beekeepers uh, website. So something to look out for. And you know, please get involved with the National Bee Improvement Programme. Um, lots of information on the Bibble website. Um, and the best book, uh, so to date on bee improvement, uh, Roger keeps threatening to uh, publish one. Um, the best book at the moment is by Joe Widdicombe, um, Principles of Bee Improvement. And that's that picture there is from a copy of the book and it's available through all good booksellers um, and as they're shut at the moment, mainly through Amazon. Questions? Do you, do you want me to? Oh, do you want me to... Uh, so thanks very much, uh, Kevin. Um, yeah, we got some questions. <laughs> um, I think I'll start with one, which, which I cut out about three of them. Um, we've had uh, questions asking where you got the stock from, and other ones, how far away did they come from? So if you don't want to reveal where you got the stock from, um, you, 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 you've got a bit of a get out clause there. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very happy to, to say I got them from Joe Whittakin. Um, from his native stock on the Rain Peninsula. There is a, a kind of a contradiction in moving bees about, but um, the idea is that we move just the queens and we do it <laughs> until we've got a sustainable stock of our own and then we keep the bees that we've got. So the idea is that, yes, we do need to move them um, a few hundred miles from Cornwall to Essex, um, but... You know, once you've got your stock, then you've got your stock. I don't think it matters that much if it comes from a similar sort of area. The problem comes, of course, when you're um, uh, shunting stuff from di different climates. Yes. Uh, this is a geographic one. Why West Suffolk beekeepers? I thought Lavenham is in South Suffolk. Uh, yeah, South West Suffolk. It comes under West Suffolk Beekeepers Association. Right. Um, right, there's, there's quite a lot going on in Hampshire. Um, uh, sorry, I know this is your talk, uh, Kevin, but um, uh, there seems to be a lot going on in Hampshire. If anyone is interested in um, uh, starting a group, then contact um, the, um, uh, uh, the group secretary, uh, Brian Holcroft. <clears throat> Um, but anyway, there's, there's one here. Any advice on insurance? We have a small one-year-old group um, in Hampshire have set up a community project with all the documents, but not sure on insurance and likely cost. Well, the, I, I, know, I don't know if people saw, but the BBKA did have a policy, but there was only about 2% take-up, so that's been discontinued. But I think you can still um, arrange that. And I, know, I, I don't know who our own... West Suffolk has got its own policy to ensure its apiary and equipment. But I can't remember who that's with, but, you know, I'm, I'm not great on the detail, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, by the way, on the, uh, on the chat, um, uh, Richard's just put up the, uh, um, the URL. Um, Kevin, have you created a type of manifesto or contract for people in your group? Definitely not. It's, it's, it's kind of like the opposite of what I want to do. So everybody turns up like, you know, it's, there's usually a, a, a regular core group and then people who dip in and out. Um, but it, it's, it's really, we're all volunteers and we're, we're just working together to uh, achieve a common goal. Um, so, you know, committed it to paper becomes formal. You then, you're into GDPR, you're into uh, a lot of admin, and I'm all about the bees, not the admin. Yeah, snap, so am I. <clears throat> um, we've got a re really general question here, which might have several answers. Um, how do you deal with the hardcore believers in Buckfast and Karnica? I don't. Good. <laughs> well, you know, it, people who come to the group are obviously like-minded. And um, people that um, we, there, there don't seem to be too many in our area, if I'm honest. There, there's nobody that's, uh, we don't have too many imports. I don't have uh, a real particular issue in Suffolk. Um, you know, I, 
I'm pretty much open that, you know, lots of people are going to believe what they believe and uh, I'm not going to change people's minds by um, having an argument about it. Um, we are doing what we're doing and uh, we'll see what, what happens. Persuasion is the best means, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Um, Demonstration. Have you, have you had any trouble with nasty colonies after flooding areas with AMM drones? Uh, not at all. I mean, the... The bees that I, I've got from Joe have been so, so calm. They are unbelievable. I mean, I can graft next to an open colony, five feet away from the open colony, and hood down, and the bees do not bother me. We've got second, third generation queens, and, and we've not had any aggression at all um, so far. And if we do, the queens will get cold. Um, and we'll we'll replace them. Okay, I've I've got two questions. Yeah, I'm going to roll into one, um, mm. but I'll ask the two individually. Kevin, do you pay rent for your site on Water Authority land, and do you have a formal agreement for access to the land? Um, the there's no formal agreement. The we don't pay rent, you know. The water authority wanted us there, you know. It was kind of like there, they wanted us to reintroduce the native bee onto their site. Um, so there's, there's no rent. In fact, they've given us several thousand pounds out of their money to pay for equipment. Um, and, and the the only agreements have just been by email, so it's just been saying that you know, this is these are the rules and. That's it. So we, we do need to let the uh, Essex Wildlife Trust know when we're on site. Um, but other than that, when we meet at the location, so that's no, no great hardship. Um, and that's it, really. So there, there's no real hardship there. Yeah, in looking at some of the vegetation, um, it seems as the ground might be a bit on the damp side, a bit sort of almost marshy. Is, it, is there a problem with chalk brood? Or, or is it marshy in the first place? Uh, well, yeah, it's next to a reservoir, and um, uh, last winter, not this winter, the winter before, we did get flooded, um, and uh, one of our members, Bill, uh, drove down to the site. Um, the the areas monitored, and we had a drone picture showing that the hives were um, close to being inundated, and, and Bill virtually dove into the water, um, with water going over his wellies to to rescue some of the bees. Um, you know, some of the polynukes were starting to float away, but fortunately the current was pushing them into the hedge. Um, so yeah, th there is a, a bit of an issue. We have had um, a couple of colonies that have had pretty bad chalk brood, um, but it, it's not a, a particular issue. You know, it's just one of those things. And, and actually, we've had so few winter losses of the, of the colonies. It, it's quite remarkable, really. OK. When you distribute your daughter queens, what are the financial arrangements with the receiving beekeeper? Um, at, well, at the moment, we're only, we're only distributing them to our members, so they're, they're going for free. All right. OK. When you keep the emerging queens in a queen right colony, does that not prompt the colony to swarm, introducing multiple queen cells and then all those virgins? Um, well, the, it's the a, virgin it, queens... It's a, it's a standard question, really, isn't it? Yeah, well, the, the, the virgin queens are in uh, cell protectors and um, they're above a queen excluder. And the, the bees are quite happy to tolerate them for a few days. The, if you don't put cell protectors on, the bees do realise that they're um, queen right. So if you don't put them on, I mean, we put them on on day seven after grafting, so day 11. But if you were to leave it to day 12, 13, the bees would start to reduce the, the queen cells if they could get to them, which is hence the protectors. And the bees will happily feed the virgin queens. Um, for a few... Uh, I think after about five or six days, I've left them in my own colonies and then the bees 
uh, start to seal them up and stop feeding them. Um, but certainly for two days, we don't have any issues. And this one's probably a bit early to tell, but are you noticing less winter losses with the new native bees? It's, it's very difficult to tell because, you know, it's like in my own, in my own operation, I've lost 10 colonies out of 100. Um, you know, we haven't lost any, we had no winter losses at Aberton, but that's not really statistically significant. So we, I could say yes, but it's just not, there's not enough of them to make it statistically relevant. I'd have to look at losses over five years, but we didn't lose any last year. We didn't lose any this year. But and, that's... And, and probably bigger numbers too, Kevin, haven't you? Yeah. Um, right, this one, I don't know if you really can answer or not, but I'll give it to you anyway. Husband or oh, our first year beekeepers, we're hoping to increase hives this year. My husband is planning to make the <laughs> always blame the other side, don't they? <laughs> My husband is planning to make uh, two frame nuke boxes. Is this the best way to start successful splits? What should we do as a start to increase colonies first year? I think I think splits are great. I mean, when I when I got into <laughs> bee farming, I started with six colonies and I split them all six ways, and I did this by. Uh, taking the queen on a frame of brood and putting her into a, into a nook with a frame of food and then four of foundation um, and then fed to that and then let the bees create emergency queen cells and then every frame that had a queen cell on, I made a new cup with it. So, um, and I didn't do it all at the same time. I did it over, over a season because uh, frankly I didn't have the equipment to do it uh, that much quicker and um, or when the colonies swarmed I took that as an opportunity to to split the colonies several ways um, and, I, and I went from with a, with a few swarms that I collected I went from six colonies to 36 in my first year as a commercial beekeeper um, and got a few hundred pounds of honey so um, I would say the easiest way to make increases to do simple splits. Mm. Um, in our, yeah, I'll, I'll chip in. I'm not, I'm not sure we're a lecture, but um, I'm actually giving a lecture in a couple of weeks on, on this very, very su subject. So if they want to listen in, then they can do. Now, I'm putting, I think, two, um, uh, two questions together. One's a clarification and the other, I believe, <laughs> is from the same person. What do you do with your own bees? And the uh, the rider really is uh, queen rearing, that is. So I assume these two go together. So do you use the same methods of queen rearing in your own bees for 100 colonies as you do at Aberton? I, I do, yeah. Um, so my own operation, I've got a central mating site and I've got a, an apiary within that for producing um, daughter queens. I've got four apiaries in at 90 degrees to each other within two kilometres of that. And then I've got another eight, 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 which will soon be 12, that are within seven kilometres. So in, in, in every direction of the clock, if you like. So I'm, I'm flooding, I'm, but I'm in the middle of, you know, um, Suffolk. So I've not got any sort of like ge geographical border. Um, so I have, but I have managed to get what's it, 15, 17 sites to put my daughter queens. And my method is that each year I raise a lot of queens. I've got 60 mini nukes at a time. Um, I can I can produce those. Um, I, I work, personally, I work on a four-day cycle. Um, and I'm basically pushing my daughter queens out into the out apiaries, if you like, away from the mating hives. And um, those daughter queens will push out drones that are, um, are carrying the genes of the three queens that are my best. So up till, up till now, I've basically used winter selection, natural selection, I've propagated from my best and I've culled my worst. And that is open to everybody to do. 
and I thoroughly recommend that. And I've I've noticed a huge difference in the temper of my bees. Um, I'm also getting much better spring buildup amongst my bees because I'm selecting from the bees that have that trait. Noticing a lot be better health of my bees, partly because of winter losses. Um, so I'd say the first three things are all you need and everybody can do. Um, you know, just basically, you know, accept your winter losses as it, it's really, really hard and, and it can be demoralising to look at a dead out. But, you know, that's actually just weeded out a, a problem colony for the next year. Um, you can cull your queens. Again, it's emotionally hard to do. Um, but a quick nip of the head and thorax and chuck them in the bush. Um, hard to do, but necessary. Uh, what the bees would do, in actual fact, if they had a queen that wasn't up to their standards, they would knock her on the head. Um, and then propagate plenty of queens. And again, just remember that you're going to have failures at every stage. So, you know, I looked, I talked about 20 graphs and getting nine mated queens. Well, of those nine mated queens, some of them will, will, will mate properly and will immediately supersede. Um, and then some of those colonies will not make it through the following winter. So the, there's losses at every stage. And, you know, you start with 20 graphs and you might get, you know, half a dozen really good colonies. Yeah, somebody's almost asked that question. Perhaps you'd just expand a tiny bit to answer it. What ratio of bees get cold if nine mate? How many will survive the cull in each batch, typically? Um, well, I, I, I don't cull. I only cull the queens once they're heading up, up a full colony or they don't. So with, with my own bees, I've got, I'll probably end up with um, up to 20% of the colonies that survive won't be in a good state at the start of the spring flow. And if they're not in a good state at the start of the spring flow, then um, they, they need to be combined so that they are strong enough. Um, and and it's, it's something I'm still working on, if I'm honest, is, is what to do with a bit, with a bit of the weak bees in the spring. I don't know if you what what would you do with a weak colony in the spring, Roger? Because you might be able to help me. It depends what it depends what it was weak, really. Uh, I mean, if it was obviously disease, and I I wouldn't I wouldn't mess around with it. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you 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 get a queen that doesn't doesn't get fire, fire firing on all cylinders, yeah. and you, you 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 can't do much with it. You just got to put it together with something else, and then yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if if it's not strong enough to produce honey at the start of the spring flow, then that, that's a good time to cull. There might be lots of reasons like disease. The queen might not have mated properly. Um, you know, I, I have sort of like sometimes added bees, but I, th I think to be honest, you're better off uh, combining and, and, and starting again and requeening as soon as you've got spare queens. Um, well, sometimes, Kevin, you can have a queen with good genetics um, that has just uh, gone down for whatever reason. Um, well, you might as well grab what you can from her. Uh, Absolutely. So, yeah, so I'm, 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 obviously, if you've got a queen that is three, four years old and she's been fantastic up to that point, then that's, that is a very different yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but if you've got a queen that um, was heading, let's say she was heading up a strong nuke going into winter and in the spring she's heading up a weak nuke, she's kind of like going backwards. I've also found that, you know, moving colonies into nukes to get them over winter doesn't really work because no. they're going backwards for a reason and they'll probably die anyway. So you might as well nip the queen and combine. Yeah. It's different. Um, there's a different <clears throat> attitude having 100 colonies and uh, having two or three, though, isn't there? <laughs> that's, yes, that's absolutely. Um, right. No, um, you might not want to answer with this one because it's... Um, um, firstly, there's her company's involved, and secondly, it's some um, personal view. Uh, but I'll give it. Uh, notice in one of your slides, you had a picture of the Below Mini Beehive um, mating hive. Are they easier than Apodias to use for mating? Yes. So, um, I mean, I got this the this from Steve Rose, who yeah. Roger will know in Wales. He he uses them, and the. 
the, the Abello hives, the, the, they're two in one, which I, I don't particularly like. But the, the thing is that they're just that little bit bigger. So what, I, what I'm picking up and what, what I've started to do is I've started to actually overwinter these. Um, they, they are, the frames in them are eight inches by six. So they're quite a bit bigger, well, a lot bigger than an Apidae frame. And they, they're designed to be operated as two in one, which can be a bit of a faff because they've got this like temporary divider. And as my personal funding allows, my aim is to get them to use them as single um, nukes and then overwinter them, um, overwinter queens. So I've, I've overwintered um, a couple this year that have got through. Um, which means I've got a couple of good queens ready to use in the spring. And I'd like to be in a position where I'm overwintering 20 plus of these so that, again, I've got, not only have I got my nukes that I've overwintered, I've got mini nukes with spare queens in ready to go. And also then that produces the, the frames that will then go into the mini nukes to raise queens. Well, this question is from somebody who I know is, has just started a group. And it's probably quite relevant to everybody, really. If the group were to fold, what happens to its assets? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and, and if I'm honest, it's not something that I've, I've... I think that's probably something I should have added on to the bit start of the slide. Um, not really something I've considered. I mean, technically, um, all our equipment belongs to Bibber. So um, I guess we'd... we'd uh, I mean, I don't suppose Bibber's got much use for it as such, but I guess we'd uh, sell it and uh, oh, give yes, the money I back have. to Bibber. <laughs> oh, okay. So well, we could we could either sell it and give it to Bibber or give the equipment to yeah. Bibber. Yeah. The answer is to try and keep it going, Kevin. That's a, of course. That's, yeah. that's, that's the point. Um, do the Virgin Queens in the protectors, and um, th th this is really wrong terminology. I'm not being critical, but uh, as a, a cell protector and a... Uh, a um, hair curler cage are different things. Um, but this is really the hair curler cage isn't that, that, that you're yeah. talking about. Um, right. Do the Virgin Queens in the hair curler cages always get looked after? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, th I, think, I think there may be a few that the bees don't um, look after, but I, I've got nothing, no evidence of this, but I suggest there's something wrong with them if the bees don't look after them. What I do is a lid of them um, is just put a little bit of honey in the little troughs around the edge and, and they, they can last there for some time. I do, um, I do that when they go into um, incubator, but if, if they're being incubated by the bees, they, they do a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, one comment here, nice comment. It's nice to hear that he's giving the raised queens away for, for free to his members. So that's, um, that's good. At, yeah. I know the questioner, and uh, he does a lot of that sort of thing. Uh, are you treating for Varroa? Yes. So it, it's a... At the moment, we are. But I'm... Um, in my own bees, I've actually not treated 10 of my colonies. So I'm, I'm, I am open to... Um, seeing what we have got in, in terms of resistance. And again, it's not, I can't even say the word, it's not statistically relevant, but all 10 of my untreated colonies have come through winter. Early days, early days. Ask me in five years if... Yeah. I'm afraid mine haven't, but uh, it is pretty variable, Kevin. Yeah. But, and this one here <laughs> um, is really a comment rather than a question. So the... Um, um, the poster says, this is a great project. It offers beekeepers a genuine alternative to imported bees. Would be wonderful to be able to repeat the success all around the country. Well, the answer is we're, 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 we're trying to, but it is really is very early days. And um, we are trying to do something with uh, with uh, NatBip and Bibberlead in it too. Um, it might be worthwhile just mentioning there is a new similar group starting <laughs> at Sandringham on the Sandringham Estate, uh, led by Eric Marshall. Um, 
So I'm sure through Brian, people could get in contact. But we're work, we're working there with West Norfolk beekeepers, um, and Eric's got a few people interested. I did a talk to West Norfolk beekeepers a few weeks ago, um, but the um, the Prince of Wales is is keen to uh, for us to have a, a a similar project on the estate. Okay. Uh, and the age-old one, how do you introduce the virgins to the mating nukes? Good one. So this is something I uh, picked up from Jim Pearson, um, who Biver members will know. But um, the first, there's, there's two answers to this question. One is, the first time you set up a mating nuke, I um, will... Um, I've got... Basically, I, I put the Virgin Queen into the mini nuke and I tip 300 bees uh, on her. And um, I then leave the nuke in a, in a dark room for two to three days. Um, I give them a small amount of liquid feed so that they've got, because uh, the abellos will take that, whereas an apodea won't. Um, and that means I don't have to keep spraying them um, and then at that point, they're, they're a, a colony and um, they'll stay together. If you, if you can like just put them to mix them together and stick them in an apiary, the bees will abscond and there'll be nothing left. Um, so that's how I, and the, the other thing I use is I, I, I used a, a pint um, uh, milk carton, uh, one of the plastic ones. I turned it upside down with the lid on put in 300 millilitres of water and noted and marked the level. And that then is 300 millilitres of bees, which is roughly 300 bees. Um, and to get the bees, I shake, I, I, I identify a hive I'm going to take the bees from, uh, isolate the queen, shake frames of bees into an upturned roof, kick the roof so that the flying bees go home, and then all I'm left with is, is nurse bees. And I use my little uh, scoop. It's one of the best pieces of equipment I've got and the cheapest. Um, and uh, that gives me 300 mil of bees in the go. Um, and I find that um, one frame of bees <coughs> is enough to fill one nuke. Where on earth did you get the idea of kicking a roof with bees in to get rid of the flying ones? I, yeah, I think it might be uh, yourself, Roger. <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous. <laughs> um, right, this one I think might have been um, uh, provoked by the fact that you had a line of, um, of poly nukes, yet um, wooden nukes in the vehicle. So um, uh, do you winter nukes in timber or poly highs, and how many nukes do you try to winter? Okay. Uh, in my own operation, I, off, I overwinter one nuke for two hives um, and I overwinter in poly nukes but all my hives are wood. Um, I've, I've just found a you know a better survival rate in polystyrene and, and not just a better survival rate but the the colonies come out you know I've got colonies that are so full of bees that they'll probably you know they you know last year I had nukes that uh, we're put into hives in April, and by the end of the spring floor, I'd had three or four supers of honey and two brood boxes of bees out of them. Right. This one's um, fairly close to you. Thanks, Kevin. I would love to see your apiary. I'm looking to add British bees to where I live north of Colchester. I have lots of space. Where should I go to get some new colonies established? Come and join you, I'd have thought. Well, yes, yeah, uh, I'm on the... Uh, uh, Suffolk Essex border just outside of Sudbury um, so you know pop down to Aberton and have a chat you know have a look at what we do uh, right, okay uh, this one's probably a bit early for you I think but does supersede your queens play any part in your queen rearing program bearing in mind they are considered to be best queens um Certainly in my own, um, but uh, Aberton, um, it's not something we've really been um, looking for. And, and the, que the queens that are there are quite young still. Yeah. 
Uh, somebody else, uh, Claudio, also um, uh, has got a project in Hampshire. Um, well, contact Bibber and uh, we'll see if we can uh, help you. Uh, hi, Kevin. With so many hives, what method of swarm control do you use? Now, I guess they, they mean your own swarm control rather than yep. Abbotton, but yeah, carry on. My, my own swarm control is um, I, I manage the brood in my colony, so I, I practice swarm prevention. Um, so every time my colonies in, in the, during the spring flow, if they get to eight or nine frames, I'll re remove one or two, and then I'll use that in my queen rearing. Um, I also clip all my queens um, so that I can do 10 day inspections. I thought I found that some colonies can swarm within five days. So seven day inspections don't work. They work most of the time, but not 100%, but marking and clipping your queens works 100%. Um, so last year, I had 12% of my colonies try to swarm, which is remarkably low. I think I think 20, 30% is pretty normal. And um, I, I do some benchmarking with other bee farmers and you know they, some of them have had swarm rates of up to 60%. So part of it is managing. Or well, the other thing I would mention is that I, if a colony tries to swarm within two years, in the, if the queen is uh, last year or this year's queen and they tried to swarm, then the queen is culled, the drone brood is culled because I have a, I have a frame of drone foundation in every colony, um, not for culling the drone for producing drones, um, and. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take the genetics out. Um, I think I do, I'm a big believer that bees will evolve to your management technique. So whatever your management technique is, stick to it. If you're using double brood, stick to it. Um, I use single brood, standard national in my own colonies. Um, but I do take the uh, pressure off the colony um, and I get very low numbers of colonies wanting to swarm. <coughs> okay, this is one we can all answer, really. Is there a register for queen rearing groups that we can use for reference and advice? Well, obviously, on the Bibble website, um, there's a list of groups. There are also some more. If you are interested in um, joining a group, then um, uh, uh, click on the link there. Uh, contact Brian Holcroft, and he mm. will help you. But I expect you'll be prepared and willing to help in your area, Kevin, wouldn't you? Absolutely. I, I, I obviously before Brian, I was the group coordinator, and I still have a few people who contact for help that I'd built relationships up with before. So I'm always happy to help where I can. Yeah. Um, I know this person isn't far from you, um, but um, uh, have you seen any black queen cell virus? Well, yes, I think I have. Um, I, I've, I, I believe um, black queen cell virus is linked to Nasima. Uh, Randy Oliver believes Nasima is linked to Varroa. Um, so, so I kind of like think if you keep your Varroa levels under control, then you probably won't see too much of it. Um, so, yes, I've, I, I did have a few batches at the start of last season that came to to nothing and the, and the cells look I, I, i'm not really like I, I, it's difficult to know if i've had it really because i've not really seen it up close but I, I think i might have had it right is it um possible to requeen a carniolan hive with the introduction of a black native bee to build up a first hive of black bees um, yes, I, 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 I don't know the identification of the question, so I don't know. But I, I would say yes, yes, it is. But I think you've got to think before you go down that route what you're trying to achieve. Because <laughs> if you bring, if you buy, buying a pedigree B is the same as buying a pedigree dog, um, because your pedigree B um, will probably last you a couple of years, and then there'll be a daughter who will mate with the local bees, and um, you, you've, you've then got a choice of either buying a new pedigree bee and that's not really very sustainable. Um, so 
if you want to keep pure bees, pure native bees, then I would recommend get involved, get a local group together and work with others because you need a lot of bees to be able to be successful at doing it. But everybody can keep good um, locally adapted bees if they want. And I would suggest that everybody start with good local stock uh, before you move on to trying to yeah. keep pedigree bees. That, that, that I think makes, uh, makes sense. Um, right, okay, I think a lot of these are just sort of uh, um, comments, really. So anyway, uh, I think that's, um, that's uh, uh, done that um, uh, pretty proud, really, uh, Kevin. Um, well done on what, what you've done. Um, I know you've been going out for three, four years now, haven't you? Yeah. And, um, you know, it is early days. Um, some of the questions are, uh, are clearly expecting you to have, have, uh, have kept going uh, longer than that. Um, but um, a good round of questions. Thanks very much. Uh, best of luck. And um, uh, thanks very much, everybody, for listening. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you very much.